18th birthday, I was hit by a car. Wow. And I was taken to hospital. And I was the first person in the north of England to recover from a ruptured liver. Wow. So I'm now 60 years later and three or four days. I've lived that much longer than I was expected to. Wow. Because after they'd operated on me, they, I still didn't die. <laughs> That's a good thing. So they operated again, and they thought that'll definitely kill the little sod. Um, and I still didn't die. Um, but subsequently, I was actually in um, a train accident, train crash, where three people died. Wow. But not me. I was knocked over by a motorbike. I went through a car windscreen, it was being driven by someone else, and we hit something, and I went through the windscreen, and you can't see them anymore, but I had 35 stitches in my face. Um, so that was uh, that was my first attempt at uh, self destruction. Wow. You have nine Aided lives. Self destruction. <clears throat> and then it's true. Now the separate incident. Yes, I've been stabbed uh, by three women. Stabbed. Stabbed with a knife. With a knife. <laughs> what do you mean by three women? Like ex-wives? What are, what are you talking here? Uh, one was a girl I lived with um, back in the 1960s, um, and one was my uh, my ex-wife. Wow. I, I can't remember the third one. There was another one. And then there was a I, – I was nearly killed by someone, again, a Polish girl I used to live with, <laughs> so, who threw a plate at me, what? and it ruptured an artery. Um and I would have died if, uh, but I went to a hospital. I went to a hospital which was near where I lived. I lived near Harrods. And today I would not be alive because that hospital was closed down. Wow. Um, I would never have made it. I can't remember what other things I mentioned. So, so what else did I say? Wait, so I want to talk about copywriting and direct response marketing, but I have to ask, so why did they stab you? Um, hmm. The first one, uh, because she was pathologically jealous. Uh, the second, the one who threw the plate, I can't remember the second one. The one who threw the plate at me, uh, because I said something rude to her and she was Polish and very excitable. And she didn't mean to kill me. Um, and the third one, because she found out that, uh, I'd had an affair with her hairdresser. That was my third wife. Um, and funnily enough, I've just had my daughter, the daughter that was was the result of that affair, um, who is now 18. Uh, she's been overstaying with me for a month. Wow. Just gone back to, she's got a, a full scholarship to NYU, <coughs> the performing arts. And I heard from us today that she's got um, interviews with two record labels lined up at the moment. Um, really? So that was how, yeah, wow. Sonny and um, Sonny and uh, Rock Nation, which is Jay Z's label. Wow. And I think she's got another one lined up with Atlantic. But I'm not That's sure. great. She's she's eighteen. She's pretty smart. Wow. <laughs> That's unbelievable. So. I'm going to introduce you, Drayton. That's that's a, a good start to the interview. I'm wide awake, even though it's past your bedtime. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, with your consent, can I include that in the interview, or sure, if you like? Okay, yeah, let's let's do it. Let's rock. Anything. Well, as you say, people like stories. <laughs> you know that better than anyone. <laughs> so, all right, Drayton. I'm going to give you a formal introduction here. All right. Dr. Jeremy Weiss, I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. If those first stories Drayton just told did not get your attention, I'm going to give you a formal introduction. Today we have Drayton Bird, who's one of the legends of copywriting and direct response marketing. Drayton's worked with many of the world's leading brands, including American Express, Ford, Microsoft, and many more. He's helped sell everything from Airbus planes and Bentley cars to models of London buses. He's written several books, 
first a novel called Some Rats Run Faster. It's 50 years ago this year, Drayton. That's right? That one, 63. Yeah, yeah. It's is 50 years ago. Yeah, wow. exactly. Yeah. And you also wrote that it didn't sell that well for a very important reason, and all writers and speakers should pay attention. So I'm going to ask about that. And you wrote Common Sense Direct and Digital Marketing in 1982, which is in 17 languages. The new version is called Common Sense Marketing. And you also said there's a good reason for that change, which we'll talk about. And you also wrote the book called How to Write a Sales Letter That Sells. You co-founded a marketing agency in 1977, which went on to become the UK's largest direct marketing agency before it was bought out by Ogilvy and Mather in 1984. And you ran the world's largest direct marketing agency for David Ogilvy. You've received numerous awards, including the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Capels Awards. The Chartered Institute of Marketing named you as one of the 50 living individuals who've shaped today's marketing. And to top it off, oh, that was... That's not my fault. You keep getting that rubbish. It's not my fault. Don't blame me. <laughs> to top it off, the late advertising great David Ogilvy said that Drayton, quote knows more about direct response, direct marketing than anyone else in the world. Drayton, formally, thank you for, for joining me. I'm half asleep. <laughs> it's night time here. I should be in bed. <laughs> After that intro, you should not be asleep. But I have so many questions for you. How late do I have with you right now? How much time do we have? 40, well, you said 45 minutes, 45 minutes. Okay. But I'm like a tap, you know, you turn me on. Well, that's I why I asked. running until you turn me off again. That's why I ask. <laughs> so do you, want, do you want me to stop asking questions of 45 minutes or? or stop you... when everyone falls asleep. Okay. Until you fall asleep, <laughs> that's when I'm stopping. Um, I want to ask a lot of questions, but I want to break down the intro a little bit. Um, tell me, uh, what's a memorable, funny story that you remember when you were working with one of the the big brands? <laughs> a memorable, funny story when I was working with one of the big brands. I can't think of any stories when I was working with one of the big brands. No Let notable with uh, Bentley or American Express or Ford or Microsoft. Any stick out to you? I remember... Um, an appalling experience uh, when I was working on Ford, and I went to see the the market, the head of marketing, um, and it was one of the most impossible uh, meetings I've ever had because uh, th these big clients frequently treat with people with sovereign contempt, and it was very difficult to present to this guy because every now and then he would get up, leave the room, take a phone call, and then come back again. Uh, and people talk an awful lot about the, the partnership between agencies and clients. Uh, this is like the partnership between a dog and a lamppost, yeah? Uh, <laughs> the, the client being the dog. Um, when clients get to a certain size, they're incredibly difficult to deal with. Yeah. Um, I've, I've, they have lots and lots of money, but you go through a lot of aggravation to extract that money. Right. Um, I can't say I missed them all that much. <laughs> so what did you do? What did you do at that time when you're obviously dealing with a really difficult client and situation? You have to be incredibly patient and disgustingly polite, you know, absurdly polite. And you have to be, be lamppost-like. Right. And <laughs> stand there and take it as it comes. Yes. <laughs> and, and take the money. That that client, I can tell you a thing about that client. This is just after I'd sold my agency to Ogilvy, and I didn't run uh, Ogilvy. I ran the I ran the international side of uh, what is now Ogilvy One, um, mm -hmm. and I was the worldwide creative director. Mm -hmm. And I used to go around the world trying to find good people and talking to clients and schmoozing and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember that Ford who were the biggest client of Ogilvy and Mather in, in London at that time. They brought out a new car, but they were they they couldn't make their minds up what to do about promoting it. And eventually, the, the, the chairman of the agency, who became a very good friend of mine, a guy called Peter Warren, wonderful bloke, 
um, he took his, he really took him, he said, we're going to run the commercial, we're going to make the commercial, and you're going to run it. Uh, and they, we made them, they made them, you know, we made the commercial at their expense. Um, that took a lot of balls, you know. And I think to do with that sort of client, you've got to have a lot of balls. And I, I handled the Mercedes account for quite a long while after I left Ogilvy. Uh, again, very, very difficult people to deal with. And you've got to, you've got to hold your nerve. And you've got to charge like the U.S. Cavalry, <laughs> otherwise you're going to go broke. <laughs> so when you say you handled the Mercedes, what were you doing with them? Well, that was very interesting. Um, I was actually sent, I, I can't remember how I met them, but I, I got a meeting with the head of passenger vehicle marketing. And they said to me that I'd been told by their agency that... Um, they just weren't happy with the tone of the communications their agency was using. And so I went to see this man in um, at Mercedes outside London. And I said to him something along the lines of, I understand you're not happy with the tone of the communications. We've been talking for a little while. And he said, no. And I said, I said, have you ever sold cars yourself? <clears throat> and I knew, because I know a bit about I've, 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 I cannot drive, but I've worked on, I think, nine different car brands. <laughs> you personally, you can't drive? Yeah, yeah. I can remember once I went to Frankfurt and I wrote a, a complete launch campaign for, for several different vehicles for all Europe in four days. This is when I was a bit more energetic than I am now. Um, Sometimes I think, you know, not knowing about something is an advantage, not a disadvantage. Yeah. If you know about something, there is a tendency to for you to assume that everyone else does. Right. Yeah? Right. Um, but I remember um, saying to this man, you have you sold cars? And he said, yes. And I said, um, and I said, we've been talking for a little while now. And he said, yeah. Because I used to be quite charming in those days, you know, I could engage people in conversation. They didn't throw me out. <laughs> and I said, uh, when you were selling people to cars, cars to people, did you speak in the same way that you've just been talking to me? And he said, yes. And I said, well, that's the sort of language you should be using in your direct mail. Because... You know, direct marketing is just, it's just a, all advertising, as, as was pointed out by John E. Kennedy in 1904. Uh, it's, it's just a substitute for salesmanship. You, you, everything, you, what you have to do is replicate um, what a salesman would do. And that's how I got the account. We didn't have to do a presentation or anything. And they were spending um, in fees by the time I'd finished with them. Well, by the time they'd finished with me, um, one and a half million pounds a year. What's that? Two and a half, two and a half million dollars a year in yeah. fees. Yeah. And I had, um, I think, 10 people working for me. So it was quite profitable. Wow. <laughs> so you talked about selling. So what did you, you sold Bentley cars, Airbus planes. What did you do to sell Bentley cars? Well, it, I have two roles in that respect. Um, I write, I write copy um, to invite people to come to events. I'm actually something I didn't mention in my my biography. Um, I'm the chairman of a company which runs events for a number of companies, including Volkswagen, uh, Bentley, Jaguar, um, and we've just actually done a deal with um, Top Gear. We're, we're starting to run events for Top Gear. Um, and I write copy to get people to come to the, to actually come and come to the events, mm -hmm. to come and, we discovered, or rather I didn't, my partner, Ian, who actually runs the business, because I couldn't run, you know, I couldn't run anything. Uh, I couldn't run a brothel on a troop train. <laughs> um, he, uh, realized that 
uh, the prospect of sitting next to a car dealer and driving a car up for half an hour while the car dealer bends your ear about how wonderful it is, is one of the most depressing prospects in life. And he, he, uh, he thought it would be a better idea uh, to give people a chance to really discover the car in nice surroundings. Mm -hmm. And he went to some people, this is a bit complicated, there was an agency that was founded by people who worked with me who had an account for the Land Rover or the Range Rover. And they introduced this idea, instead of just the way that people had been selling cars, of taking a country home, a big country estate in England, a noble, you know, residence, and renting it for a day and inviting people to come along and drive the car and do a number of other things such that they might find agreeable, such as meeting Lord so-and-so, so they would feel very flattered and de da de da de da de da Yeah. And he actually left that business and I fun funded him uh, uh, to start this new business by introducing him to this guy from Mercedes and from that we built a business um, which has dealt with all sorts of cars and, and other clients as well, but mostly cars. Yeah. So that is what that's that was a nice way of selling something. You know, that's so what you put in there, the letter to get them to these events that was so compelling that they showed up. Letters, brochures. We, the, the first one we had, somebody sent it to me. Actually, I've got it here somewhere. Um, so it was a, a beautiful book, a beautifully bound book, which introduced the Mercedes experiences. Uh, this is the the first client we had, Mercedes. Yeah. Um, at one time we had Mercedes and Volkswagen, which was very very tricky. We still actually run uh, a, a place. Um, in uh, outside London where young drivers come and learn to drive um, and where people learn to drive we we run events for people who for you know advanced driving courses and that sort of thing it's all very complicated and quite hilarious to me bearing in mind as I said that I cannot drive a car <laughs> so Drain, what's another one of your favorite direct mail campaigns that you wrote the campaign that I'm proudest of um, is one that I wrote for Save the Children charity. Mm -hmm. At one time we had so many charitable accounts um, that I used to joke that all we needed is one for the middle age because we had helped the aged, Save the Children, Royal National Institute for the Deaf, uh, Something for the Blind. We got the lot. You know? Covered all your bases. <laughs> if you yeah. had a disadvantage, we were there to help. Um, <laughs> And the Save the fundraising director of Save the Children came into our agency in Soho in London um, and said to me, um, do you think you could get people to leave money to us in their wills? Hmm. And I've always, and I said, of course. And I always do this, you see. This is like called digging your own grave. You know? Literally. I had no idea how I was going to do it. And this happens to me all the time. I'm constantly doing things, agreeing to do things, and then being utterly desperate because having agreed to do them, I have no idea whatsoever of how to go about it. So I said, of course I can. And I went away in despair. I spent a lot of time in despair. Um, and what you, you asked me in your, the little questions you sent me, you said, what do you do to get yes. ideas? Desperation, number one. So what do you mean despair? <laughs> Tell me about that. Because I never think I can do it. You, the, 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 the minute you think you're good, you're in trouble. Yeah? I, I have a saying that uh, um, the two things that I believe is that the, the, the road to failure is paved with success. Yeah? <laughs> so the minute you have a lot of success and you think you're doing well, you're in trouble. Conversely, the road to success is paved with failure, you know, because when you fail, you've got to try harder. So that, that despair is very important to yeah. me. Um, I think, um, obviously, imagination is very, very important. Um, but despair, incredibly important, incredibly important. Uh, one thing I found that, that tends to give you ideas is exercise. 
exercise stimulates the flow of blood mm -hmm. to the brain. I still do 100 press-ups uh, uh, twice a week and a number of other things. Like push-ups? Sometimes three times. Those press-ups, yes, press-ups. Ah. Um, so what did you so do still... for the Save the Children? Um, well, I went for a walk with my dog, having drunk the better part of a bottle of red wine, and tried to think of somebody I thought was a perfect prospect, somebody who might leave money uh, to save the children. And that's always a good idea to try and think of the perfect prospect. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought of my mother. And my mother um, at that time was getting old and thinking um, a lot about what was going to happen when she died. She would talk to me about her funeral and what she wanted in her funeral. Very, very encouraging. Um, yeah. And so I wrote a letter which began, uh, which along the lines of, have you ever thought of what would happen when you're, you've gone? You know, would you like to make the world a better place? You know, and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. Well, some year, eight years later, um, um, somebody was interviewing me, somebody in America actually, and had asked me for examples of my work and something I was proud of. And I said, well, I can't think of anything I'm proud of. <laughs> he said, tell me all about the awards you've won. I said, I, I, said, I have no time for awards. Um, you know, they, they, they have nothing to do with results. It's just what people think. Mm -hmm. And the worst judges of marketing are marketers. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's that they're not buying, you know. Right, the right. Are buying. Yeah. Um, so, where was I with that one? Um, you're, you're, um, you were writing the... Oh, oh yes, and I, I rang up a friend of mine who was then the creative director of Ogilvy and Mather because by that time I'd left. And I said, Steve, I said, can you think of anything good that I've ever written? And he said, he said, well, you know that thing you wrote for Save the Children? It's still running after eight years. Wow. So that must have, that must have, I remember that at, it's a very interesting letter if you're a copywriter because I never actually asked for any money. I just said, could you leave money to us in, the, in your world? You know, mm -hmm. And I did say, uh, I'm not going to ask you for money, but if you, you, we do a fantastic work. And I sold some heart-rending stories about children. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to send them money, you know, we won't stop you. <laughs> so that letter not only worked for eight years, but it got more money in than any other letter that had ever run. Yeah. So that's that, that. I was quite proud of that. You know, I was quite proud of that. So, Drayton, you yeah. mentioned too about you told some stories about the children, and you're obviously a really good storyteller. What are some ways you craft your stories in the copy? I have no idea. Uh, I, because I saw you'd ask, you, you were thinking of asking me that, and I thought, how do I tell stories? I've no idea. I start with something. I try and start with something ludicrous um, and go from there. Um, preferably something about some, something about a mistake I've made. People never object if you start talking yeah. about mistakes. I have yeah. no And the, when I was talking earlier about the first book I wrote, why it didn't sell, and yeah. the, the lesson for most people. Yeah. And people ask me about this book. Somebody in, in, I think in America actually, said she's going to buy this book. Because it's still around somewhere, you know. And I said, I said, don't do it. I said, you'll regret it. You know? <laughs> and she said, why? Why will I regret it? And I said, because there's. I said, it's very well written. But I said, I said, my partner. I live with an Italian girl. Um, when she read, she started reading, and after the bit, she said, after a bit, she said, well, it's very good. So, but what's what happens? I said, nothing happens, darling. Nothing happens. <laughs> so there was no story. Yeah, the only purpose. Uh, Joe, I'm very fond of Joe Sugarman, um, yes. who's a lovely man. Every year at my birthday, he's, he always sends me birthday wishes, and he's the first person every year. And I was t told him this year, I said, you, you, you're always the first one, Joe. I said, I'm useless. I always forget your birthday. <laughs> but I remember seeing him in London years ago when he talked about his philosophy, which essentially is, is wonderfully simple. It says that the only thing you've got to do is to make people read the next sentence. So as far as stories are concerned, that's all I think about. You know, I just think, how can I get somebody to read the next sentence? I don't care whether it's a story or not. I just want people to know 
what comes next yeah yeah that's that's all it is i mean do, and when copy falls apart it is frequently because the writer has not thought what comes next uh, before you uh, called i was revising copy for one of my young i have a, a, a crew of young people i call the young birds because i'm far too old for this game so i i spend my time messing them about um and he'd written some very good copy for a, a very, very interesting medical product. And the main thing I did was I just swapped some par paragraphs around. And I said, look, I've messed around with your copy. I've changed a few words. Uh, but I've moved some paragraphs around. And he said, yes, you're right. It's much better that way. Because I know what I'm, – I'm always thinking, what would they like to know next? Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's all you've got to think about. What, and this applies not merely to the copy – but to the sequence of communications, yeah? So sometimes, I mean, one of my other writers sent me a series of emails for a, a client somewhere in Europe, yeah? And I just looked at them, and I didn't change the copy very much. I just changed the series. I thought, this is not, this is not in the right order, yeah. you know? Very important. Yeah. So what other big mistakes or common mistakes do your young birds make that you have to correct? All copywriters, uh, including me, because I write copy probably five days a week, um, make the same mistakes. First of all, they think if they think it's good, it's good. <laughs> so the minute you start looking at it and think this is wonderful, forget it. You know, <laughs> there's something wrong with it. You know, because you're not the customer. Right. Um, they do not. Um, they fail to put the incentive very up front because what I give you is going to be more persuasive than anything I can say. So some, well, mostly, but not always, the incentive should be up front. Um, they fail to give all the reasons why somebody should do what you want them to do. Every reason I fail to give you to do what I want you to do is a sale I lost. They fail to overcome all the objections that people might have, all the reasonable objections that people might have to doing what they what they ought to do. They fail to well, one sees this so often. They use fancy words when they should use short words. Um, they use marketing expressions that nobody's interested in. Um, they forget that the word "you" is the most wonderful word in the world. As opposed to the word me, well, you know, I mean, I'm sure everyone in the, listening to this knows very well all these mistakes. And they write, it's, writing copy is very, writing copy is a very simple thing, but a very hard thing. I'm still working at it. Mm -hmm. I'm still working. At How'd it. you get into writing copy? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I... When I was young, my parents had a pub. Uh, they took a pub in order to make lots of money, which they did. And they also took a pub in order to be able to send my brother and I away to good schools. So I was sent away at seven to a boarding school, which I hated every minute of. I ran away from it when I was 11 and they sent me back. And then I went to a public school. Is that common, and what's it? Is that common to send, be sent away to boarding school or, or not so much? Yeah. It's not so much now, but it's still quite common. Yeah. And though my brother went away when he was five because he wanted wow. to be with me. Yeah. It seems cruel uh, and obscene, but it's always been the case here. Um, what this gave me, apart from a, quite a good education, was a taste for a reasonable life. But because I, the school I was at was all boys, the subject of sex was something of a mystery. And the minute I discovered girls, I was extremely excited. Now, you won't remember this, actually, Jeremy, because uh, it, you weren't born. But sex was discovered in 1956. <laughs> yeah. um, Tell me about that. And, and I was one of the first people. I, 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 I discovered it, yeah? And having discovered it, the first thing I wanted to do was to put it into practice. Okay, and in those days, that was the wonderful um, 
American comedian. I used to have a a long playing record of him. I can't remember his name now, but he he had a wonderful story about sex. Again, in, in, it recorded in the 1960s. And he said, he said, in those days, if you managed to get a girl very drunk on the Southern Comfort on Coke, she might let you feel the outside of her bra. So it was like that. But I managed to get beyond that stage, and I discovered not only sex, but also fatherhood, to my surprise. And I ended up marrying a girl rather earlier than I'd expected. And because we had no money, I ended How up young living were you? in... 21. Okay. And uh, I ended up living in a house in where I was living outside Manchester, called, a place called Ashton on the Line. The house had two rooms upstairs, two rooms downstairs, an outside toilet, and we were the only ones in the row with a bath. And people used to come along and ask if they could use our bath. Really? Yeah, because they didn't have a bath. This is true. Yeah. So I didn't have much money. <clears throat> and I'd, all, I'd, I'd got a scholarship to Manchester University. But I didn't like it at Manchester University. For I what? Far... What do you get a scholarship Pardon? for? Academics or? Uh, well, I'll tell you. Um, I actually got my scholarship for my English, but my parents didn't know that because I'd been run over <laughs> the day after my 18th birthday, wow. yeah. and I, I was at death's door. So they put me in for modern languages. <laughs> anyhow, I didn't like. I didn't. Anyhow, I didn't like university. I didn't. I spent all my time in low clubs, um, drinking and looking at women, um, and and getting one of them pregnant. <clears throat> and I walked out of university at the end of the first year. The the lady who was running the Spanish oral said, uh, "Hey, cómo le gusta la universidad? How do you like the university?" I said, "No me gusta much. I don't like it very much." And um, Kevin, I said, "What are you going to do?" And I said, I'm going to leave. And she said, you're not serious, are you? I said, yes, I'm going to leave, and I'm going to leave now. And the other day, I found a letter from that university dating back to, what, 1955, 55, 50, um, yeah, 1955, telling me that I couldn't come back until I completed my first year's courses, <laughs> one of which was Latin. Um, so I walked out, and after a while, I got a job um, at... Um, a magazine called Cotton. In those days, there was a big cotton industry in, in England, which they managed to ruin. Um, and I, I was the assistant editor. I used to write the editorials. And I also used to operate a machine that sent out, put the stamps on the, 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 the addresses on the envelopes, a thing called the addressograph, multigraph. This was an early example of automation. <laughs> but one day, a friend who was very well connected, he was working in advertising. He was actually a member of what was known as the Princess Margaret set. He was very grand, and he said to me, he said, you know, you do rather well in advertising. And I said, really? He said, oh, yes. Why? I don't know. I can't remember why he told me that, but I went to Manchester Public Library, and I read all the books on advertising, both of them, in an evening. <laughs> And I thought, I like the sound of this. I like the idea of persuading people to do things. I like to write, and I'd like to make a bit more money. Well, I then spent six months trying to get a job in advertising. Very, very difficult, because uh, they all said, you know, we don't just take copywriters, you know, like that. You know, you've got to go through the ranks. You've got to be, be a messenger boy and blah, blah, blah. Mm. And eventually, I managed to get an interview uh, with an advertising agency in Liverpool, which was quite a long way away from where I lived. And the man said to me, why should I give you a job as a copywriter? And I said, well, <clears throat> there are two reasons. I was free, in fact, I said. The first is that I can write. And he said, really? And he said, show me some of your... And I showed him some of my stuff. And he said, you can write. I said, the second is that I was brought up in a pub he said, he said, why, 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 why should that help you? I said, believe me, uh, Mr. Mr. Hill, Roland Hill is name. I said, working in a pub and meet, seeing people when they've had a few drinks and serving them teaches you an awful lot about human nature. He said, that's true. And then he said, what's the third reason? 
And I said, I have an extraordinary fund of knowledge about all sorts of things. And I think that that's what you need to be a copywriter. He said, really? He said, can you tell me how the difference between how a two-stroke engine and a four-stroke engine work? And I said, yes. Because oddly enough, I knew. <laughs> and I told him. Wow. And then he said, what's the name of the Plymouth Evening Paper? I had no idea. <clears throat> but he asked me about 10 questions. And he said, all right. He said, you do have a lot of knowledge. You can write. He said, I'll take you on. How much are you getting paid? And I said, seven pounds a week. He said, all right, we'll pay you seven pounds a week. I said, Mr. Hill, I can't live on seven pounds a week. He said, I have to come from Ashton Underline on the other side of Manchester, blah, blah, blah. He said, all right, we'll give it. I think he gave, I think I was actually getting nine pounds a week before tax. We'll pay you 11 pounds a week. So every morning I used to get up at four o'clock or five o'clock, go to Liverpool and, and then I would work and then I would, um, I would uh, go for lunch. I used to go out, buy a loaf of bread and a tin of sardines some days. Other days I would buy a loaf of bread and some cheese. And other days I would buy a loaf of bread, a small loaf and some pate. Uh, and that's how I lived. Um, so what was um, a big turning point for you then? Ah, well, I, I had to leave that agency eventually. The turning point was the day when I discovered in that agency, and I've been discovering it ever since, that nobody in advertising knows anything about advertising. Just as nobody in marketing knows very much about marketing, or very few people know anything about marketing. There's a wonderful report uh, that I read about a month or so ago by the Fournays Group into marketing directors. The overwhelming majority of whom seem to be unaware that return on investment has anything to do with marketing. I, d I think it's a wonderful thing to go into a business where nobody knows what they're doing. Even a fool like me can make a living. Yeah? So eventually I fell out with the agency because I was a bit eccentric. They didn't like the way I dressed. They were very conventional. They'd heard me saying very impolite things about the deputy chairman. They'd heard me swearing rather a lot. Uh, and so I thought, right, I'm leaving. And I wrote my first personal direct mail. I'd already written some direct mail for them. And I wrote to five agencies in Manchester, which was closer to home. And I got three interviews. The first one, I turned down the job. The second one, I took the job. And they said, uh, after I'd been there, would you work in public relations? How do you feel about it? And I said, well, I, I'm not very keen. And my boss said, why? He said, I said, well, I, advertising is to public relations as lying is to perjury. So he said, he said, well, it's either that or the sack. I said, I'm your man, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Knowles. <laughs> and I did this public relations very badly for about six or seven months. And then he said, I'm sorry, it's not working. We're going to fire you. And he got me, I eventually I got a job next door. And this was the biggest agency outside London. And there I was working on big, big accounts. Um, and once again, I was a very obstreperous young man. I had a fight with the creative director, helped four of the other copywriters to get a job. For one of them, I wrote his application letter and started going down to London to look for, to break into the big time. And I nearly had a ner nervous breakdown doing so. Why? But eventually, I because I just, I'm a very nervous guy. <laughs> really? Oh, no, the stress was terrible, yeah. I, you I don't strike it. me as a nervous person. Well, we're very good at camouflaging these things. Okay. <laughs> Us nervous people. <laughs> um, so eventually I got a job at an agency, which shortly afterwards bought by Leo Burnett, and I was a group head. Um, and then somebody wrote to me, and that was one turning point, but then somebody wrote to me and said, would you like to have an interview for the job of copy chief at CPV International? This is a well-known agency. And I went for the interview. And the man who interviewed me, a lovely man called Jack Swab, he said, look, he said, we've had other copy chiefs, but they've never been able to impress their personality on the agency. We have a very, very talented but difficult art director. And... And I said, Mr. Schwab, I guarantee I will impress my personality on the agency. Whether the agency will like it is something else, but I guarantee I will. 
And what happened was he then said, OK, we'll offer you more than you're getting. And that, by this time, I was making three times what I was making in Manchester in a space of 18 months. Um, and he said, we'll pay you so-and-so. And he said, he said it's a marvellous opportunity. Why don't, why don't you think about it? And I said, well, I want so-and-so. <laughs> I said, why don't you think about it? <laughs> and I remember walking out of this building in, in Mayfair and walking up the street and thinking to myself, nothing can stop me now. And on Monday, he rang me in and said, OK, it's a deal. And within six months, I'd got rid of the, actually, it took me a bit longer to get rid of the art director, who I last saw selling ties in Liberty's department store. And I'm ashamed of myself because he was actually a very talented guy. He was just very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was a big turning point as far as advertising was concerned. But then I got increasingly fascinated by the mail order business. Um, and a man who'd been a director of the agency uh, said, will you come and see me? And I'd, what I'd been doing was I'd been persuading all my clients, the ones who didn't need to get coupons in their ads, to put coupons in their ads so they could measure the response. Mm -hmm. I was absolutely obsessed with it because I'd started, I'd read Ogilvy on advertising. I'd read a number of other books by early mail order pioneers, Max Sackheim and people like that. Um, and I realized that there were two types of advertising, the real stuff that you measured and the bullshit that still goes on today. Mm -hmm. yeah? So this guy took me to lunch um, and he said, we've got this product and, and we wonder whether you think you could sell it. And I said, show me what you're doing. Show me the product. The product was a bodybuilding product called the Bullworker. And, um, and I looked at it and I said, show me the figures. And he showed me the figures, and I look, and I, then he said, "Show me." Then I said, "Show me, you know, exactly what you're sending out." And, said, and I said, "I can sell a thousand a week of these for you." Huh. And he said, "If you can sell a thousand a week, you know, we'll pay you even more money than you're getting um, in cash, <laughs> and um, you'll." And the minute you tip a thousand a week, you know, we'll give you. I think I can't remember ten percent or twenty percent of the company. And I was selling a thousand a week by May. This was in October, oh. and by September they realised I'd got all their numbers wrong, and they went broke. <laughs> really? Why? They got their numbers wrong. They were they. You know, they they. If you got your numbers wrong, you know. So how are you selling a thousand a week? What did you do? I wrote a bunch of advertisements. I, I got an education in marketing in direct marketing partly because i met some people who i didn't know at the time were legends in the mail order business one of whom was gene schwartz who's really very very famous a lovely man he introduced me to modern art he took me to an exhibition in mayfair of robert rauschenberg the lovely lovely man and he offered me a job um and i didn't take it because he said he said he said, "Have a look at this book." He said, "See if you see what you could write about this book. And see, you know." And it was a book called *The Art of Selfishness*. And I wrote a headline that said, "Is this the most immoral book ever written?" Something like that. And Gene said, "Shall I show you what I wrote?" And he wrote, so he'd written something almost identical. Well, wow. and I said, I, "I can't work for you." I said, you, "I said you, and you, you know." I said, "I, I was frightened." <laughs> <laughs> I did that twice. I did that. Joe Carver, who wrote The Lazy Man's Way to Get Rich, he offered me a job years later. Um, didn't I? Didn't you know? I don't know. Lack of courage, lack of self self belief. But I met him and a number of other people, and I learned a lot from them. But also, I was effectively the advertising manager for that product and other products. So instead of just having to write copy. I had to learn other things. So I learned how to negotiate for space. I learned all about sending out follow-ups. And some of the Americans, there's a guy called Bernie Silver who, who taught me a lot uh, about direct mail follow-ups, you know, and about dealing with customer complaints and that. So this is hugely valuable because, you know, the problem with a lot of people who write copy 
I would say most of the people who are copy is all they know about is copy. And this is this is as if you're a man walking down a street and you don't realize you're in a big city. And outside the big city there's a big world, yeah? Mm -hmm. And outside the world is a, you know, and so on, yeah. Right. So I st I became very very interested not just in copywriting, not just in direct marketing, but in business. Yeah. Um, but I was still interested in advertising, and I, got, I then, um, when that business went broke, I did a deal that didn't come off, which would have made me obscene amounts of money, um, because Sam Jezefovitz, who'd bought um, the Bulworker business, um, I, I was offered, a, I suggested a royalty deal, which one of his, his cousin, who ran the English business, had agreed to. But Sam said, no royalty deals. Then took me out to tea at the Ritz and said, would you like to come and work for me? And a friend of mine said to me, don't work for him, he'll kill you. <laughs> he'll, he'll work you to death. <laughs> um, so I then went back into advertising. I got a job with what was then the hottest um, agency in the world, I would think, uh, uh, called PKL, Papert, Koenig and Lois. They were the people who, some of the people who wrote the original Volkswagen advertising. Yeah. And I worked for them for a about 18 months and I realized that there was a whole other aspect of advertising that I didn't understand. Um, the aspect of what, you know, the big creative wave that had taken place, I just couldn't grab it. I remember writing an ad to launch the Audi in England. I still shudder when I think how bad it was. Yeah, tell me about that. Like, no, I can't. It's dreadful. It's, it's absolutely dreadful. It strategically it was wrong. The wow. layout was shit. I wasn't. I'll tell you why it was wrong. Uh, the Audi was a combination of a, Merce of a, a partnership between Mercedes and I can't remember who. And I went entirely on the wrong route. I went on a sort of macho route which said Mercedes put the power in. Can you get it out? My creative director thought was, this was brilliant. He was actually a very clever, brilliant guy himself. He was brilliant, but he was wrong, and I was definitely wrong. You know, and the layout was wrong. It didn't look right. It it didn't have style. It didn't have, you know, when you're talking about a car, you're selling a dream. When you're talking about a car like that. You know, you, that's what you've got to be thinking about. You're not. I shouldn't have been talking about the utilitarian thing. I'm not. I wasn't selling a bloody racing car. You know, understanding the the psychological appeal of what you're selling. Of course, I understood how to sell people how to be big and strong. You know, funnily enough, quite a few people <coughs> in the business, you know, have have said to me, "Oh, I bought that a guy called Joe Vitale or Joe Biden. I don't know. He rang me up once and he said, I." Hey, I understand you wrote all this stuff. I want to interview you, and you tell me how you did it because I bought one of the damn things, you know. <laughs> and I've quite a few other people. They're still selling, you know. So, so that's that. that then I was, um, I was always wanted to. So I was now very interested in business, you know. So I was trying to sell mail order products. Even when I was at uh, my first big creative practice job, I was trying to sell mail order products. Not very successfully. What were the other mail order products that you worked on? <clears throat> I've got a lovely story that um, people always laugh at. <clears throat> at that time, hairstyles, which are actually coming around to be the same thing now, were sort of bouffant. Yeah? Okay. And so people had, people had what they called wiglets, which were like little postiches, as the French used to call them, to make give volume to your hair. Hair pieces. Yes, yes. So I wrote an ad to sell hair pieces with a partner of mine, his father, Peter Benson. His father, his, his parents were furriers, and we used their office. And I wrote this ad, and what people had to do was to send in a lock of their hair with their order so that we could match their hair. And we had a hairdresser who was providing the stuff. You know? And the first day we went to my partner's office um, we couldn't open the door and we didn't realize we couldn't open the door until we finally opened the door and realized there was a huge pile of envelopes inside we couldn't get inside we were going to make five thousand pounds which today would be fifty thousand more wow. yeah wow 
and then I think of divide probably 100,000, you know, from one ad. And guess what happened? So all the hair samples were placed on a windowsill. <laughs> that sounds like a bad idea. You can see it coming, yeah, somebody <laughs> over the window. <laughs> so we didn't make so much money. And also, uh, my partner described the hairdresser as a gonif, actually, because he decided to do the deal himself. Of course, he didn't understand what made the ad work, so he didn't. He lost his money. And that was one of my first attempts at making a fortune. And then I started a business with a partner um, in 67. Um, by 1970, we were in the Times newspaper as being t t one of the coming entrepreneurs of the decade. Uh, that was in January, and in May, we were going broke. <laughs> And in, uh, I was standing in front of the creditors. Um, Why they go broke? We go. We you. One of the questions you asked was about mistakes that people make. Yeah, big mistakes. Yeah. Um, one of the big mistakes. I mean, I've made so many mistakes I can't count them. But one of the bigger ones was I. I had a, a very very nice accountant called Danny Auerbach, and. He's, and we were opening businesses right, left, and centre. And he said to me, you should make them all separate. And I didn't. And I think I blame him because he should have hit me until I made them all separate. <laughs> um, because one of the businesses, I discovered uh, a deal in America, which I'd sort of, it will, this, this, the, the way it was running, I'd copied. Yeah. And it's a, you could say what amuses me is that what goes around comes around. When people talk about aff affiliates, it's the same thing as agents, yeah? And um, so I'd, I'd, I'd seen there might be, I thought there might be a market for fire extinguishers. I'd seen there was a market for fire extinguishers. And somebody was selling them in America, and I got somebody to make an aerosol fire extinguisher. And I ran ads that said, uh, make so much a week, uh, or, or all your money back, yeah? looking for agents. The psychology of it was very simple, that <clears throat> if people didn't sell, they were too ashamed to say, I can't sell them, or they couldn't be bothered. You know, I mean, a lot of, you know, money back deals work because of that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and um, after a bit, I'd noticed another deal that was very interesting, which was called franchising. <laughs> And I thought, oh, I know what we can do. We can bundle all these agents that we, we're getting into groups and sell them to people, yeah, mm -hmm. as super agents. Brilliant idea. And we were, we were making so much money. Of course, there were terrible flaws with this. We didn't realize that the agents really would be no bloody good at selling. You know? um, but nevertheless, we were making more money than God. Until one day... One of the newspapers ran a piece saying that these things are dangerous. They do not conform to British standard, blah, blah, blah. They don't work. Now, one of the companies I had at that time was called the Business Ideas Letter. And the girl who was the sort of man running it, <coughs> by the most extraordinary coincidence, knew, went to the same pub as the firefighters who had conducted the test at the the paper had based its whole thing on. Mm -hmm. And it turned out the test was rigged. Furthermore, there was no British standard for these blasted aerosol things. So I went to a lawyer in Lincoln's Inn in London <clears throat> who looked at me and, and I said, um, I said, so what do you think? And he said, oh, you have a very good case. He said, you will undoubtedly recover. And I said, recover what? He said, well, damages, costs. I said, oh, that's great. I said, how long will that take? He said, oh, these newspaper Johnnies, you know, they take a long time. Two years? <laughs> I said, I'll be broke in four weeks, which I was. And there we were in front of the, the creditors. My partner wanted to leave the country. He was so frightened because, of course, the books were all over the place. Um, and I said, no, and I'd been terrified because we'd got all these... One guy ringing up saying, I'm going to break your legs. I'm coming to the credits of me. I'm going to break your legs. And my partner, who'd been wonderful up to the point, lost his nerve. Um, and I was terrified. 
And eventually, I, what, I, what I did was I went round and I found everybody I could meet, and I said, would you like to be my creditor? Any friends? I said, be my creditor, send me a bill. <laughs> and they did, so I had a packed creditors meeting, and they, were, they would ask, because all the people who, who liquidate the companies are crooks, yeah? Um, you know, the first thing that happened when we went broke was the, co the cousin of the liquidator came in to look at the, the furniture and blah, 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 yeah. So I went broke. But I just stood up in front of uh, the people there and I said, look, you all seem to me to be over 18. You're not children. Um, you know, I, I didn't certainly plan this, you know. I didn't, I'm very sorry. I feel really bad about it, but. Can I do? And the guy who said he was going to break my legs came out and shook my hand. He said, you're obviously an honest man. And one of Britain's leading advertising people came up to me and said, shook my hand and said, Drayton, you will undoubtedly be a millionaire one day. <laughs> and then I went back into advertising. Yeah. How do you recover from that? I mean, going from broke, having to talk in front of a big group like that to, I mean, that's a shot to your ego, to your confidence. Terrible, terrible experience. Um, what you do is you do what you can do. Um, what I, what I, I'm not a bad writer, you know, of any kind. You know, I'm a fairly good writer. Um, and what I could do is write. And so for the next seven years, I would write anything for anyone about anything. I wrote presentations for Ford, I wrote speeches for the chairman of Imperial Foods, I wrote film scripts for people selling property, I actually made a film for somebody selling property, um, anything whatsoever. I would write chapters of books, there was, one, there was one company that used to send me, they'd send me a brief and say, we need four chapters by Monday, and I'll mm -hmm. do it over the weekend. Uh, I wrote about, I wrote what, part of a book about the American Cowboy, part of a guidebook to London, part of a book, a wonderful book called The CIA and the World Weather Conspiracy. <laughs> um, Drayton, let me ask you, um, I don't know if you're falling asleep yet, but we are, I just looked at the clock, we are past that time. So if you have, if you have time for several more questions, I'm game. If you are ready for bed, then I will wrap this up. You can go on for a little bit. Okay. All right. So go on. You were saying I uh, I interrupted you. So, well, yeah. then, so then I can tell you, you know, relatively briefly what happened there. Um, I was the, direct marketing was coming in, and I was having a drink with a friend of mine. Actually, somebody who could out. One of the things I did during this period, I would be a freelance creative director. Um, and one of the people I'd helped to train said to me, you, you know more about this direct marketing thing than anyone I've ever met. You should start some kind of a consultancy. And we ended up starting going into business, and that's the business that we built up yeah. very, very fast, you know, uh, with nothing. We had no office. We had no money. We were all in debt. I was still in debt to the Inland Revenue to the tune of £10,000, which today would probably be like 100000 know. Wow. Um, so I was living under a false name for during those seven years when I was writing all this stuff because I didn't dare put my head above the parapet. What yeah. was your name? What was your false name? David D. McMahon. That was the McMahon was the the name of my second wife's first husband. Yeah. Um, so you didn't care if he got killed or what? <laughs> 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 so so we started this business and and I. The thing was, um, advertising agencies and agencies generally are not very good at, you know, you'll notice that advertising agencies never advertise themselves. Yeah? Right. <laughs> very interesting. <laughs> don't, take my medicine. I don't. <laughs> um, so we used, we did everything. Yeah. We started running events. We ran a series of events around the country um, to promote the idea of direct marketing. And I cool. got we made a lot of money, I think £10,000, something like that, and I got an award for the letter I wrote to do it, and we got our first clients, and then we started running advertisements and made press. Uh, we would have go to any event whatsoever, except I had one proviso. I said to my partners, you can go to this event, 
only on the understanding that you bring back enough money to pay for your ticket, yeah? yeah right, yeah. So we did everything we could. And then I wrote this damn book. Um, Which one? This is the Common, the common oh, Sense one got in 82. Um, and we were approached by a lot of agencies to sell. Mm -hmm. And in the end, we sold to Ogilvy. And mm -hmm. it so happened that I got on very well with David Ogilvy. Um, indeed. Um, for some reason. I don't know. Um, and so then what was that like? What was the sale like, the sale process? Oh, bloody hell. God, it was boring because we were negotiating with grey advertising until midnight the night before. And we decided they were a bunch of idiots. Um, so they asked us, their guy asked the most stupid question. He said, how can I be sure that he was a, an ex-CIA guy, apparently? He said, how can I be sure? How can I be sure, you know, you guys are going to stick around after the sale? I said, I said we've got a three-year deal. You know, we've got to stick around. And I, I took my partner to the, right to the loo. I said, let's, these people are idiots. Let's leave. You know? <laughs> and so we did a deal with Ogilvy because we liked Ogilvy. Mm -hmm. um, and David had actually rung me up. And, you know, they were clever. Um, and then the first year, their age, their office, they, they had an agency in London, which was in such a mess that their clients were asking for their money back. So I renegotiated the deal with Ogilvy. It took a five-year deal, or it was a three-year deal, and then they put me on the board and made me worldwide who are. Um, and then uh, Martin Sorrell came to buy the business. And he took me out. To, he took me out to lunch. He took me out to dinner. He wanted to know what I wanted to do, um, and I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. He, I remember him saying to me after dinner one night. He said, "He said, what do you want to do?" I said, "I want to do something remarkable, Martin." And he said, "What?" I said, "I've no idea." <laughs> Very irritating. But he, but I got you know, he's a nice guy. Uh, if you're on, if you're not competing with him. Um, so eventually I thought, one day I ran into him and he said, oh, how are you doing? I said, I think I'm going to leave. <laughs> he said, why? I said, I don't want to spend the rest of my life working like a dog to pay back all that money you borrowed to buy us for too much money. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so did you, at so that I, point, have to work after the sale? Or that was just part yeah, of the because deal? I, because I kept on, I kept on marrying and I, just my third wife was extraordinarily good at spending money. I mean, she, the only, she, she bought... A house without telling me, and when she bought a house without telling me, she then bought a swimming pool that cost more than the house, also without telling me. And she's been chased for money in respect of money that money, uh, money that was borrowed in, for the for the oh. swimming pool, I think. So she was very good at spending money. <laughs> First, so when I was, you know, when I was eighteen, I discovered sex. You know, when I was seventy, I discovered. I have to get rid of money. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, no, I've knew her for much longer than that. Um, so, Drayton, you tell me about some of the memorable interactions with David Ogilvy. Uh, David, the first time I spent any time with David was in Amsterdam, and I I was late. I'd gone to the wrong office. I was sweating like a pig, and I used to wear a lot of aftershave and cologne. And I walked into this office and David was sitting there and he said, oh, come and have, sit down. I sat down next to him and he looked at me and he said, is that you? <laughs> <laughs> you smell like a horse boudoir. <laughs> so I said, I said, how, how do you know? <laughs> and we just got on very well because I, was, I never flattered him. Um, and he, he used to criticize me. I've got a wonderful video that I've shown sometimes of him talking to management trainees about, <clears throat> saying something about me. He's saying, he's saying, whatever you do, don't do what Drayton Bird do does. He goes around the world making speeches, dreadfully bad off. <laughs> <laughs> and he, I mean, he, he rang me up one, he rang me up one day, and I, and I said, hello. He said, David here. He said, just back from making another speech, are you then? <laughs> he, he was um, the hardest working person I've ever met. Um, <clears throat> I remember he rang me one day at 10.30 in the morning, about 10 o'clock in the morning. And he said, um, David here. And I said, I know. Um, I recognize your voice. And he said, what's wrong with Ogilvy and Mather? That was it. And I said, I said, 
I'll think about it. He said, write me a report. So I said, all right. And he said, by the way, happy Christmas. <laughs> it was Christmas Day. Oh. So I spent the next day writing a report. I was very lucky because Martin Sorrell had asked me to write something. Um, and so I was able to combine the two. <laughs> um, so what did you write? I just wrote what I thought was wrong with Ogilvy and Maiden. I mean, what was wrong? I've no idea. I can't remember. <laughs> if I had to guess, um, I can remember some things. I can indeed remember some things. In an advertising agency, as the advertising agency started to buy these different sort of specialities, divisions, um, there was an incentive, for instance, for Ogilvy and Mather advertising in London to keep as much revenue as it could away from Ogilvy and Mather direct in London. Yeah. And Ogilvy and Mather promotional campaigns would try to keep money away from Ogilvy and Mather direct and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And the core of what I wrote was really suggesting that the the method of compensation should be changed. That's a, that, that I know is the chief drive. I also, around the same time, I wrote something for Martin. He asked me to write a presentation for him, which he never used because he Martin's not he's not a flashy speaker. He's got a couple of jokes and he's very serious. And I wrote a thing called Back to the Future, which involved showing a clip from the film and suggested that um, advertising had lost its way, which I still believe, by the way. Why? Um, well, because when I came into advertising, <clears throat> the first three or four jobs I got, one was to write some direct mail, one was to write advertisements for a restaurant, one was to write a salesman's organiser, the sort of thing that a salesman carries around as, as an aid memoir. <clears throat> Nobody said to me, that, oh, we're going direct marketing today, you know. Yeah. I've never thought there was any difference. I, I, there, there is a tendency, a, a tendency to too much specialization. Yeah? And I, this does not just apply to advertising. But so all these people have got their little specialities. And this goes back to what I was saying to you earlier on, that I, by one, for one reason or another, I found myself engaged in different disciplines. At one point, I actually was helped set up a research company. Um, so I run events. When my our business back in the 60s, we ran events. Yeah, We started our business in, in our direct marketing with an event. We organized a yeah. series of events up and down the country. I, I, I think there's a huge mistake in, in you know differentiating all these things. Mm -hmm. And I think that to to be frank, that to be just good at you know one of them is not very impressive. You know, it's, right. it's just rather it's a very limiting, uh, short sighted. So that was what I was saying to them, and that's what yeah. I think about. Dream. When I was I was looking doing some research, and I think I saw something about Royal Mint. Did you do uh, campaigns for them? Phew. I've been writing for the Royal Mint off and on um, since. 1986, probably. Uh, I was writing for them last year. Uh, and uh, there is a, you know, there are, although one says, you know, being specialist is not a good thing, you should be a specialist, but also a generalist. Yeah. Um, the approach to selling um, collectibles is a special approach, just as the same way as. Say, the first time I was asked to write charity, I didn't understand how to write charity. I couldn't see what the benefit was. Uh, the collectible market as it exists today was really set up by uh, Joe Siegel, who also started QVC. He started the Franklin Mint. And one of the jobs I had in my the last year of my exile from being me <laughs> was to the Franklin Mint. Um, yeah. This man rang me up, very got a very got very lovely man called Ed Siegel. And he said, uh, he said, I'm told you're a very good uh, direct response writer. And I said, ha oh, ha, I said modestly. <laughs> I said, <laughs> <laughs> 
And he said, well, he said, I'd like you to come and see me. I said, where are you? He said, I'm from Franklin Advertising. I said, what's Franklin Advertising? He said, we do the advertising for the Franklin men. I said, oh, I said, you're the people who sell things to people who don't know what to collect. He said, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned from him a lot um, about how you sell collectibles. What did he tell you? It wasn't so much what he told me. It was just that as I, <laughs> I learned a lot about, I learned one thing about coffee. I went, he gave me a job to write, which was to sell a set of medals for, to, to celebrate the achievements of the Belgian kings. Now, this is bloody hilarious. The only, the only more stupid uh, thing I could heard of being sold was one to sell a set of medals to celebrate the heroes of the Mexican Revolution. Well, the heroes of the Mexican Revolution and God help Mexico, I feel really sorry, you know, Mexico, so near to the United States, so far from God. Um, you know, they were all shits, the heroes of the Mexican Revolution, you know. The, the Belgian kings were, you know, with one exception. I mean, Leopold was one of the most unpleasant people who ever lived. He turned the Congo into a vast slavery estate, you know. So that was a difficult job. But anyhow, I went to where I charged him as much money as I could think of. <clears throat> and uh, and he didn't blink an eye, you know. So oh, that should have warned me. <laughs> so I went to her and I wrote the copy. And he took it and he he uh, he took it and he looked at it and he put his glasses down like this, which he used to do. And he he started reading it out in a sonorous voice <laughs> to celebrate the. And then he read the first paragraph, and then he looked at me and he said, Drayton, what do you think they'd like to know next? And I said, I get your point, Ed, I'll go away and do it again. <laughs> but what I learned was this thing of making something special and of focusing on people's desire to own and fear of loss. I remember I was once asked to write something uh, to, sell, <laughs> to sell some plates in Italy which nobody else wanted to buy. They'd actually, they tried to sell them in Belgium, no luck, you know. And I wrote a thing like, you know, <clears throat> Vicar of Franklin Mint Collector, um, you often have the opportunity to buy things which nobody else will ever have, nobody else in Italy will ever have the chance to, to even see them. Uh, such, a, such is the case with the, <laughs> the unsaleable Belgian cake. <laughs> and you'd all say, you've got the first three, you need the other one, you know. It was always this fear, fear of missing something. Mm. And so when um, I worked with them for quite a while, actually, it was very interesting. There were some very talented people there because they used to hire failed entrepreneurs. Always a very good idea. I saw it. It looked really interesting. I don't know what if it was the outside of the package that you're mailing out was very unique, right? <clears throat> the Royal Mint one. Yeah. Um, they tend to be very formal. Um, I, 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 I worked for them last last year. But they, they're quite clever, actually. What they do now is they ask me to go look at everything they're going to run and do sort of basic copy for them. Right. Then they don't have to pay someone else so much to do it. <laughs> it makes me sick. <laughs> <laughs> How much of that... No, you do you have to pay attention to? Because even though you're mailing it, it's inside something, you know, yeah. that has to get open before they even read what you're writing. Well, the purpose of the envelope, I, I've been very fortunate. Um, I know one of the things you can ask me is my bucket list of people I'd like to meet. There's nobody I'd really like to meet. I've met everybody I want to meet pretty much. Um, half of them are dead. <laughs> um, I think that... Um, one of the best copywriter generally accepted as the best copywriter for quite a while was a guy called Bill Jamie. And I became very friendly with, with him. He introduced me to public speaking and he got, gave me the worst hangover of my life. Whew. Um, that's saying a lot since you he, grew up in a pub. So <laughs> yeah, I keep practicing. I've got half a glass of wine left over there. Though. I'm saving for all of this. Um, and he always said the envelope is the, the hot pants on the hooker. <laughs> but the per the only purpose of the envelope is to get itself opened. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This may require that you say something on it. It may not. Right. There are cases where, 
for instance, uh, a different shaped envelope will get it open. For instance, we I remember us selling a legal policy. So we had it long like a legal document. Yeah? That was, I think, for American Express. Um, it may be that color will get it opened. It may be that texture will get it opened. Mm -hmm. um, it may be that something you say will... Bill was famous for for his envelope lines. One of the most uh, famous, best ones was how much should you tip when you're planning to steal the ashtray, you know. <laughs> so he was a very witty man. He, he actually wrote the libretto for an opera which he sent me, which I've lost. Um, I mean, the opera. He just wrote the words. Um, lovely, lovely man. Um, the, the, just the whole principle of all this is how do I get people to start? And then whether it's the envelope or it's the subject line, you know, I with emails, I, most of nearly all the stuff I do now is emails. Yeah? Um, all I'm thinking about is one problem is that people have told me repeatedly, if it's from you, we read it. So that what that means is that some read it. So why is that don't. a problem? Uh, because that because it doesn't help me very much if I write a better or a better subject line because you can't they, test it. people have told me that repeatedly that which seems I'm wasting an awful lot of effort. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're right. I guess right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's it's very difficult. Drayton, I appreciate your time. You've been fantastic. Um, I have one last question, but before I ask it, tell people what you're working on now. Where should they check you out? What what was I working on today? No, just now. Like, what what are you excited about that you're working on now? And what what website should they check you out for more information? Uh, they should go to DraytonBird.com. DraytonBird.com. That's sort of there's a lot of stuff on it. You know, that mm -hmm. leads you to my blog, which is yeah. sometimes funny. You have Ask Drayton too, though. Ask Drayton. Ask Drayton. The there are two places people can go to, and the basic the rule in selling is never try and sell two things at once. Yeah. But there you are. Um, if they want to know more about me, it's straightenbird.com. If they want to get um, advice on how to do better marketing, it's yeah. R Straighten. Yeah. Um, and that's a sort of a very very cheap thing. It's um, I think it's twenty nine dollars a month. And it's about an hour. What do they get? Of advice every month. They get an hour of video advice from me. The, the the truth of the matter is that if anyone's out there still listening to this, if you've listened this long, uh, then you must like me. If you like me, you can get buckets and buckets and buckets more than any sane person could possibly want, month after month. But people think it's a steal. Um, yeah. Because it is based on fifty odd years of making mistakes. Yeah. One of the questions you ask on the top is, "What keeps you up at night?" Right? That's on that on the Ask Drayton. Well, I think what keeps people up at night is it can be many, many things. I mean, what keeps you up at night? Always that whatever I'm trying to do, I can't do it, you know. And I've got to find a way of doing it. And, I'm, and I, surely I can do it better. And, and can't I? I mean, for instance, I'm working on, my, on the, the common sense revised common sense which is much shorter mm -hmm. because when I started direct marketing was very special but now everything is direct marketing because it's all on the internet so it's mm. all changed mm. so that's driving me crazy and people keep on asking me to write an autobiography and that's driving me really crazy and it goes back to what I was saying before about desperation mm. I feel most of the time most I would say sort of 80% despair and 20% euphoria yeah 20% view you for is when you solve something and you look at it and you think it's good and then after a bit you think it wasn't that good <laughs> and then maybe a year later you get you go back to it and then you know and you said well that was actually pretty good mm -hmm. and that's what makes you feel good yeah, yeah. so Dream, my last question the problem is every time you talk it elicits more questions so this is really my last question since it's inspired insider you know my question to you I have to ask that moment you know, that moment, what's been a low point moment for you? Because you mentioned several um, throughout the interview and what you think about that pushes you forward, motivates you to, to overcome that low point. I've, I'm a coward, I think. 
so I try to do the best I can. And my favorite quotation is from Winston Churchill, who said that courage is the ability to go from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And I think that I'm able to summon up enthusiasm. And there have been long periods in my life when I've been very, very depressed. And particularly after I reached about the late 60s, when I reached the late 60s, you suddenly realize that everybody that you, you're dealing with is 30, 40 years younger than you and thinks you're well, well past it. And it's very, very difficult to get business, yeah? And there have been long periods in the last 10 years, not so much now, but earlier on, where I'd, every week, every Monday I'd wake up after the weekend and think, oh, Christ, you know, what are we going to do now? How are we going to survive? Every month, how are we going to survive? I mean, I could have closed everything down, but I didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I don't know, it's its a despair leading to desperation, leading to yeah. just that effort to think to try again and try again and try again. And it's happened to me so many repeatedly, as you've heard, repeatedly things have happened to me Yeah. where everything, you know, gone wrong. Um, and somehow one summons up the will to carry on. Were there any points that you just wanted to give up? Only briefly. <laughs> only no, 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 only briefly. I mean, there were terrible things. I, I once went to Australia with my second wife um, to sell fake chagalls and swimming pool franchises. That's a big that difference. Was, that was, that was terrible. That was terrible. I had no money. I didn't know anyone. I was thinking maybe I could go and live in Australia. Um, didn't work out. I, that swimming pool thing was another thing. There was a wonderful guy called Sammy Gold that I worked for as a, a marketing director. He was selling swimming pools. And he said, um, he's, he's from, he was from Brooklyn, I think. And he said, hey, kid, you know, why don't you go over to sell franchises in France? So I went to France, and I ran, and I we had, I had no money, you know. I ran an ad in Le Figaro, which is like the New York Times, yeah, to get people who might buy swimming pool franchises. Then I went to a friend of mine in advertising, and he gave me a free office, yeah. And I thought, what about the language? You know, my French, it's years since I spoke, I learned French when I was young, but years since I'd I was lived with a French family for a month or so. Years since I've done it, and I thought, what's going to happen? And then the first guy comes into this office, and I, and I said, uh, "Est-ce que vous parlez anglais? Do you speak English?" Said, Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Boy, did my French come back quick! Yeah. The same. I did another job for the, someone else in in Spain, um, and I suddenly wrote, we're in a part of Spain where somebody said, nobody spoke any English. And my Spanish, which I'd studied for two years, boy, did that come back fast, you know. I had a cameraman on a jeep driving through a, gro a, a grove of olives, yeah, um, filming these girls riding on horses, yeah. For and what? trying to. I was the bloody director. I was making a film about why you should buy property in this godforsaken place, which it was. Yeah? I could go on forever about, you know, and, uh, but the wor I think one of the worst was this, this French thing because I was there and then I, once I'd got people who were inquiring, I had to try and sell the franchise, sell hot air. Yeah. yeah. And I eventually I sold the franchise at three o'clock in the morning in a club on the Ile de France in Paris to Michel Le Comte Jalon, Philippe Jalon de la Beaune. I sold the franchise. And I remember getting on the phone to Sam three o'clock in the morning. I sold it, Sam. And then the next thing I had to do is take this troop of drunks to go and install some of these pools. They were the most unreliable people I've ever met in my life. I remember lying in bed in despair. What the fuck am I going to do? Yeah. I could go on. Because you, know? you mentioned, yeah, like, you, know. you, you were bankrupt. You know, there are times you were bankrupt and just horrible things. No, I was never personally bankrupt. My business is Right, bankrupt. your business. I mean, yeah. so what do you tell someone to, what should they start doing to get through some of those things? To, because you just it seemed like in an instant just push forward and start the next business or started, you know, just did the next thing. You've just got no choice. You, you're either, either going to give up or you're not going to give up. Mm -hmm. And you, you've got no choice. I mean, that actually happened twice. <laughs> I had another business in the same area. 
where I made a horrible, I mean, I could talk to you about my mistakes all night and I don't have time, but I made another horrible mistake and it went broke. Yeah. What I did the first time, no, the second time, and I owed the advertising agency a load of money and he was very angry and I sat there and I cried. Oh. That works. <laughs> That's tough. <laughs> what do you do with somebody who's crying? Yeah. <laughs> It was, uh, I don't know, I, I just don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what you do. What motivates you now, now that you've had a great career, you continue to, what motivates you to keep going? Well, number one, I don't think I've had a particularly great career, um, but, um, you know, I mean, this is not exactly nuclear physics, this business, it's, you know, any fool can do it with a bit of effort. Um, I think... Um, well, I'm very happy that the first of the books I wrote is still selling uh, after, you know, 30-odd years, or is it 40-odd years? I can't remember. 30-odd years, yeah? And yeah, I, 1980, yeah. the reason I want to write The Common Sense, the, the other book, which somebody has actually asked me to write anyhow, after I decided to do it, somebody came along to me and said, will you do it? Um, I would like it to last for a long time. Yeah. I think that... Um, what's the purpose of being around and, um, if you can't make a difference? And it, it's actually it's true to say that I, I do get a lot of messages from people, um, you know, not every day, but quite a, quite a few days, um, from maybe most days, people saying, thank you very much, you've been a great help to me. And that's and you sort of think, well, what I do is not very important, but it is important to somebody who wants to make a bloody living. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, it's a good sure. thing to help people to make a living. Yeah, and I, I think it's a disgrace that uh, so many lies are peddled, particularly on the internet. Uh, there are two schools: there are the people who tell whopping lies who really know how to persuade, and they're brilliant, well worth studying as long as you don't buy too much from them. Um, and then there are the people who are who are in the big fancy world of you know marketing where they have titles. They're in the C-suite. I saw your post on that. What a load of nonsense! What a load of piffle! The minute you start thinking yourself important, I always remember I had a friend in the 1970s whom I worked with briefly, who was the best creative director in Britain, no question. Regularly, they run, and he's been dead for about seven or eight years, they run a program, the 100 Best Commercials, yeah? He's written more of those commercials than anyone else. His really? commercials were brilliant. <clears throat> and I remember he came into our office once and he said, Drayton, he said, we've done it. We've written the great ad. We've done the great ad. He was an art director. I said, he also wrote very well. And I said, John, for God's sake, I said, what you're talking about is what they, it goes on the back of what they wrap fish and chips in. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to keep a sense of proportion. The minute you start thinking you're important, yeah. how can you be important in this silly business? You know? yeah. How can you? It's ridiculous. Drayden, I want to be the first one. Thank you so much for staying past your bedtime and sharing all your valuable <laughs> insights. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> bye bye, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs>